welcome everybody to the, this is the Global Watch International Call and this is boot camp day five. It's Friday, April 2nd, 6 a.m. Jerusalem time. And uh, today on the final day of boot camp, we're going to hear from Reuven Berger. Reuven is the pastor of the Congregation of the Lamb on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. And he is an anointed teacher and we are believing that there's gonna be a great impartation as he speaks to us through God's word. But before he starts, we're going to, um, we're gonna have a worship song and then Susan and I have a couple of things that we wanna say to everybody. And uh, so let's uh, go ahead and get started. Susan, do you have any comments that you wanna make? Opening comments well, I here? think, I, I think if, I feel like uh, Vic and Diane, would you open us up in prayer and we'll go right into the worship song after that. Thanks, Sue. Father, we just want to thank you that we gather again today in your name. We thank you for all these nations represented, Lord. We ask for your blessing upon each person here and, and, and on each nation. And Lord, especially we want to bless Reuven and his land Israel today as we're joined by him. So Lord, just help us, especially those of us for whom it's early in the morning, help us to wake up Help us to be awake and aware of everything that you have to share with us today. We thank you, Lord Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach. We bless you. Amen. So we have a beautiful uh, worship uh, song to play for you and show. It's a video, a worship video by someone we know and we love, Karen Davis. And uh, it speaks for itself. So here goes. And let him go If you only believe 
Amen. What a beautiful song. So we wanted to, before we have, uh, we have Reuben speak, we just wanted to spend uh, just a couple minutes with you. We realized that we, we actually need to have a, a pretty full session in order to do this correctly. But we wanted to share with you uh, because this was, this was tonight, the last night was going to be about crossing over. It is about crossing over, but there's more than, there's more. And, uh, and it's sort of like we're trying to figure out where do we go from here. And the best way to, I think, talk about that is just to, to notice the things that God is doing, because God shows us what he's doing. And when he shows us what he's doing, that's the way that we can tell uh, where things are headed and, and we need to follow him. It's like um, Jenny said, Jenny Hager, that it's, this isn't an organization that you join, it's a river that you jump into. And so our job is to try to sense where it is that the river is going and, and, and what we're seeing uh, as, we're, as we're in the river. So Sue, do you wanna say a couple things, a couple of words about that? And then I, I'll, I'll jump in for a minute or two and, and then we'll, um, we can turn it over to Ruben. Well, I, I've just been so blessed to see the level of commitment and community that's been growing out of these sessions this week. And I, I hope you all feel more engaged with the vision of what the Watchman is all about in this hour. And, you know, there was just a sense of that we're not at the end, we're at the beginning. And so we're going forward with this and we'll be talking with people about developing watches and those who are already established continuing to contribute and getting that into order over the next week. Um, but we are just want to, I want to first of all say thank you to all of you and um, especially you tra translators who came and it's not easy to translate uh, uh, simultaneously. And we just want to give you a high five and a thank you. And can everybody just unmute for a second and let's just clap and thank them for what you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank 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 you through this week is that the God is raising up that relentless watchman of Isaiah 62, six. And we are moving into the Isaiah 52, eight reality. Just look across your screens. Your watchmen shall raise up their voices. They shall sing and they shall see eye to eye when the Lord brings back Zion. We're getting trained for such a time as this. And who knows how it's all going to work out truly in the end. But what is encouraging to me is to see people not falling off at the first hurdle. They're climbing back on and moving on and going forward, uh, even when the imperfect shows up, you know. Uh, and we had plenty of those little stumbles into our <laughs> Zoom rooms or our, our breakout rooms, but God, God prevailed and gave us the grace to go through it. Um, and I do believe, like Fred and I were talking, that we're in a new season with the COVID-19. And the um, paradigm of churches and ministry is all changing. It's there. Uh, we're going to, uh, this thing is not going away. I think I listened to one of the four running um, physicians in our nation who was saying this is going from a pandemic to an endemic where we're going to have to learn to live with it a little bit and that's not a downer is this has actually been a blessing for the body of christ because we're learning that we value community we were just talking about that katya weren't we beforehand and so um i just believe that these virtual platforms uh, uh from the tech industry are to be possessed by the people of the kingdom <laughs> and used for the kingdom purposes now more than ever. And if we hadn't had this, we wouldn't be doing this. And, uh, and so God is actually graduating us into a new level, I think. Um, so, and what we just mentioned uh, a little bit in passing this week in one of the sessions is that I do see a battleground 
rising up in the nations and it has to do with covenant. And so the role of the watchman in, in biblically is to really watch over God's covenant pur purposes. And so for such a time as this, I hope that you take that to heart and consider what God is calling you to do as we go forward into this. But again, I think this is a gateway to a beginning and not an end. And so we have a few things coming up, opportunities coming up, but Fred, do you have, what did you want to contribute here? You're muted. Yes, let me just say, let me just say one thing, Sue. I think the opportunity is coming up. Why don't we just share that at the very end? Mm -hmm. So let's, let's, um, let me just say this, that, I mean, it's, it's fairly obvious to everybody, but I think that we absolutely, God doesn't want us to miss the fact that he is supernaturally knitting our hearts together as we come in and we, we give glory to him and we honor each other. And, uh, and it's just, it's, that is probably as amazing to me as anything else. And, you know, here we are virtually, you know, most of the people on this call, Susan and I have not even met in, in person. And, uh, and yet God is drawing our hearts together. And this is something that he is, we can only do really uh, the way he wants us to do it when we're walking in his presence. And, um, and we're, this is a group of people that we're just honored. We're honored to be uh, sharing all of this with you because it's very clear that you're deeply committed. You're really passionate for the Lord. And, um, and the Lord loves variety he is we're united in him but we're all from we're from different nations we're different skin colors we're different socioeconomic groups we're um, we have many very very varied life experiences and and god loves that because that that makes for a stronger um a stronger family when we come together and it it, it gives glory to him and it honors him when we come together in, in unity, you know, the, one of the strongest prayers in the Bible was Jesus uh, prayer in John 17 that he prayed that he said, I pray that you would be one, even as I and the father are one. And I think we're getting a little bit of a taste of that uh, in this, uh, in the, in this group. And so we want to be, um, we want to be good stewards of it and, and where God is going. We'll, we'll have more to share about that next week. So, um, Sue, I, that's all I really have to say right now. Do we... um, I am going to just paste uh, uh, into the chat some of the things coming up, um, but we will highlight them verbally at the end. But just in case people have to fall off, I, I want this out there. We've got some, a really important session with Joel Richardson next week and a, an opportunity to bless Egypt this Saturday for a um, a significant issue rising up in Egypt. So um, I'm just gonna go ahead and if you don't mind, I'm gonna put that in the chat so you can copy and paste it onto something that you can have a glance at later, okay? Yeah, that's great. So as we listen to Ruben, um, you know, part of the reason that we're doing this on day five of boot camp is we wanna hear from, we wanna hear from Israel. Israel is absolutely central to the entire story of the Bible, and uh, and we want to get every time we, we there's an Israeli watch or or we have we hear from somebody in Israel, we are the Lord is imparting stuff things to us from Israel so that we can really be uh, so that we can really be one so that we can really stand for Israel and the people there. So, Reuben, we are just honored to have you um, speak. To us and with us uh, today. So, uh, so go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Well, thanks again for this uh, opportunity to um, be with you. Um, I'm quite moved to see how many people are with us today. And uh, this is a special week. It's uh, we're coming to the conclusion of Passover and a large part of the Christian world is celebrating uh, Good Friday and we're moving towards the resurrection of the Lord on Sunday. And uh, 
the resurrection of Yeshua, of Jesus, of course, is also the promise and the guarantee of the resurrection of Israel and of the kingdom of God that God has promised uh, to manifest on this earth. Uh, I would like to just uh, begin with two readings from scriptures that you've been uh, obviously focusing on during this week. Uh, Lord, we thank you. We thank you again for this very special opportunity today to hear from your heart and to understand better how it is that you want to complete the mystery of God in these end times and the position that you have for each one of us on the walls of Jerusalem. And we just pray that you will give us today increased vision and understanding, more of your heart, more of the burden that you're bearing, because here we are, a group of people, O oh Lord, whose chief desire is to be made one with you and that which you carry in your heart for these special days, even before your return. So we thank you for your word now, and we ask for your Holy Spirit to really be amongst us and upon us in Yeshua's name. Isaiah 62 and verse 1, for Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a lamp that burns. Verse 6, I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem, who shall never hold their peace day or night. You who make mention of the Lord. Do not keep silent and give him no rest till he establishes and till he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. <clears throat> well, this is a very clear and specific command of the Lord uh, to his people and specifically to those whom he has called to be watchmen on the walls of Jerusalem. And Habakkuk 2, 1 to 4. I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am reproved. Then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. <clears throat> uh, when speaking of being watchmen in relation to Israel, I think we have all come to understand that there are many aspects uh, to this vision. And it's, it's like a wheel with many spikes, uh, but all of the spikes connect into the hub. And the hub uh, is the center point uh, that holds the whole thing together. And once we know what the hub of the vision is, then we can stand and we can watch on the ramparts to apprehend the Lord's vision that he has spoken to us, that he has shown us in his word and to which the Holy Spirit bears witness to in our hearts. And as we stand on the ramparts, we both await the vision, as we said, apprehend the vision, 
and we continue to listen to the Lord because only the Lord knows how he himself will fulfill this vision. And we know from the many, many books that have been written about Israel, how many different opinions and perspectives there are of how God is going to fulfill his end time purposes for Israel, the church and the nations and different people emphasize different aspects of the vision. But when we stand on the rampart, which is a, a defensive wall of a city or a castle, and it has a broad top with a walk away, so we can move to different parts of the rampart to be able to get a larger perspective of the vision but also to discern at the same time, the strategies of darkness, which of course are becoming more and more apparent uh, in our times. So I, I will briefly just uh, mention some of the different aspects of the vision connected to Israel, but I will not focus on these specific aspects. Many believers are called to pray for the borders of Israel because they see the threats of the enemy, nations that surround Israel, things that are changing uh, in the Middle East, as we have seen uh, in this last year with the Abrahamic Accords. And we want to be uh, watchful to see what are the positive aspects and what are the potential dangers of such accords. Others pray much for the government of Israel as relates to issues within the country and without the country, critical matters. As we have been praying lately about the serious issue of abortion in Israel as we have seen with the corona, uh, corona crisis, how Israel has been moving more into a whole sphere of globalization that we have not seen before, trying to be number one in the world, setting an example for the nations concerning the vaccination. What does this mean? Where is it leading to? What can we understand? The issue of Aliyah, many Christians are praying about Aliyah and the rise of anti-Semitism in different nations and how their particular governments uh, in the different parts of the world relate to Israel and how their governments relate to the Jewish population within their specific nations. Then there are issues concerning anti-Semitism in the church, replacement theology, and the church having lost to a very large part its proper covenantal focus and prophetic understanding because once Israel is not properly placed uh, in the uh, apostolic pattern and focus of God's word, the church cannot discern the times, nor can she discern even her own identity as regards to her being the people of God. And then as regards to Israel, all of these things as we have uh, been sharing as you've been sharing in these last days and as I've shared twice before relate directly to the covenantal uh, foundations that God has established in Israel and God's longing to bring Israel back to those foundations rather than the false foundations that the modern state of Israel uh, to some large degree uh, is founded upon to lead to the salvation of Israel. And of course, as concerns all of the nations, it all goes back to the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 12, 
and 17 for the nations to find their blessings uh, in relation to the God of Israel as God has set out his kingdom purposes for this planet from the time that he called uh, Abraham. So we are to write the vision. We are to make it clear so that those who hear the vision may run with the vision and live in the vision. And though it often appears that the vision is tarrying and it often seems that the devil is fulfilling his vision and purposes much more radically and quickly than God is, God is always on time and the vision is for an appointed time and it will not lie. It will speak, it shall come to pass. And so the just must live by faith. So the big question of course is what, what is the hub? What is the very heart of the matter? As we move into these last days, <clears throat> it is essential that we have the proper orientation and focus, both as it concerns Israel, the nations, and the ecclesia, God's uh, new covenant people. And when we look into Isaiah chapter 62, as we read those verses, we see that the focus of the watchman is the focus upon Jerusalem until her righteousness, the righteousness of Jerusalem goes forth as brightness and her salvation, her salvation as a lamp that burns. Now, if we look at Jerusalem today, in many ways, what Paul said in the book of Galatians, chapter four, verse 25, Jerusalem is still in bondage until this present day with her children. And we know that in the book of Revelation, Jerusalem in the end times is called Sodom and Egypt. When we look into the book of Galatians, we recognize that Paul is speaking of the final exodus that must take place. It must take place for the people of Israel and it must take place for all the people of God. Now that exodus has taken place in Messiah, and uh, the church has to a large degree come into that exodus, even though there's a, a greater fulfillment of that exodus. As we look into the book of Revelation, we will see that the book of Revelation is really a Passover liturgy about the exodus of the end time and the entrance of the end time into the bridal inheritance and the coming kingdom. So the focus of the watchman is Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the heart of the world. Jerusalem is the heart of Israel. And though as believers, we focus upon the new Jerusalem, we must see the relationship between the new Jerusalem and the earthly Jerusalem. When we look into the book of Zechariah, chapter one, we will turn to that for a moment. We know that Zechariah prophesies uh, specifically to his time concerning the return of uh, the Jews from the Babylonian captivity of 70 years. But if we really look into the book of Zechariah, we see that not only is it a prophetic uh, book concerning his time, but it actually goes directly into the end times uh, and to the return of the Lord and to the establishment of the millennial kingdom. So when we read Zechariah, which means the Lord has remembered or the Lord remembers and he's remembering 
Jerusalem. And Zechariah is very directly connected to the restoration of Jerusalem. Uh, these ch early chapters in Zechariah are also very applicable and important for us in our time as watchmen. And in chapter one, verse 14, it says, and so the angel who spoke with me said to me, proclaim saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, I am zealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with great zeal. I am exceedingly angry with the nations at ease for I was a little angry and they helped, but with evil intent. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I am returning to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, says the Lord of hosts. And a surveyor's line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. Again, proclaim saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, my city shall again spread out through prosperity the Lord will again comfort Zion and will again choose Jerusalem. And then in chapter two, uh, verses 12 and 13, and the Lord will take possession of Judah as his inheritance in the Holy Land and will again choose Jerusalem. Be silent all flesh, before the Lord, for he is aroused from his holy temple. So God chooses again Jerusalem. Jerusalem, which has been placed to the side, becomes central in the plan of God. Now, what is at the center of the battle for Jerusalem? And I think the main point, and there are a few that I will touch today, but the main issue is the throne of God. Both in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 17, and Ezekiel 43, verse 7, it says that Jerusalem will be called the throne of God. So obviously the battle of the end time is the battle between the two kingdoms. And the center point of the battle is the throne of God, which is to be in Jerusalem and which is already in some very real way to be restored in Jerusalem even before the king returns to take his place on the throne of David. Now we know that he is seated on his throne in heaven, but he is not yet and he has never been seated on the throne of David in Jerusalem. And so this whole issue of the throne and the kingdom is a central issue. In fact, if we really look into the New Testament and especially into the gospels, we see that the whole teaching of the gospels is essentially the teaching of the gospel of the kingdom of God. And the message of the Lord, the, uh, Miracles of the Lord, the parables of the Lord are all connected to the kingdom of God. Now, this is, this is foundational to Jewish understanding of Messiah, the Davidic kingdom, the kingdom of God that must be established. And of course, it was misunderstood when the Lord actually came because the expectation was different than what he had actually fulfilled. But nevertheless, he did come as the king who preached about the kingdom in all its various phases. So when we contend for Israel, we are contending for its 
covenantal foundations and destiny which connects into the kingdom of God. This is also true as regards the church and the nations, because what's true for Israel ultimately is true for the church and also for the nations. And therefore, we have to pay attention to what the enemy is doing as we see a whole thrust in a very, very powerful way in this last year, this whole uh, coronavirus issue and even the issue of the vaccine has made us much, much more conscious of globalization. The, the uh, new reset that uh, one is speaking about for the whole planet. We're not just dealing with nations now, we're dealing on a global level. And of course, the whole issue of the throne of Antichrist. And of course, many, many Christians are focusing their attention on the Temple Mount, and even with these Abrahamic Accords, are speaking more and more about what could happen with the rebuilding of the Temple. Even as we have seen this year, there was a, a, a movement forward in Jerusalem concerning that issue. But I think it is dangerous for Christians to put the emphasis on the physical temple that of course could well be restored on the temple mount. But what is in the heart of the Lord is truly the restoration of the house of living stones as we read about in Zechariah, that the house of God was always the emphasis in scripture when speaking of restoration. Now, when Peter spoke his second message to the people of Israel in Acts chapter three, verses 19 to 21, and this was a direct message to Israel. And that's why it's important that we relate to it. He said, repent and be converted for times of refreshing will come until the heavens must receive Messiah until the time of restoration of all things will happen. Now, this is very significant because it connects the repentance of Israel with a time of refreshing that will come specifically to Israel, but I believe far beyond Israel, and the time of the restoration of all things. Now we remember that the Lord himself, when coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration, when asked about Elijah the prophet, he said, Elijah has come, speaking of John the Baptist, but Elijah will still come to restore all things. Elijah is the prophet. Now we do not know how this will happen. Will this be a company of people in Israel? Will this be a company of people all over the earth? Probably so. Will there also be a specific uh, Elijah ministry in an individual or more than an individual? The Lord, the Lord will reveal all of this in due time. But what we do know is that there is the ministry of Elijah, which is essential and foundational to the purposes of God for the restoration of all things. And that connects both to the destiny, the covenantal destiny of Israel, because he is the messenger of the covenant. The Lord, of course, is the ultimate uh, messenger of the covenant. But Elijah contends for Israel's restoration in her apostasy. And Israel today 
whether we want to admit it or not, is in a place of apostasy. Now, there are many ways we can look at this. We can see that God has blinded Israel. God has put a veil upon Israel until a specific time. But however we look at it, we can see that the apostasy is deepening in Israel and also the movement back to Orthodox Judaism because, of course, if the Jew wants to seek God, his, his basic understanding is to return to the faith of his fathers as he understands it according to Jewish tradition. But the ministry of Elijah is also connected very much to the whole ministry connected to the church. And if we just think of the altar uh, of Elijah that he set up on Mount Carmel, it, the, the, the main emphasis of that altar was to restore the Northern Kingdom to the altar of Jerusalem as opposed to the two altars that Jerovabam ben Nevat had established, so that the true worship of God would be restored and that the northern kingdom and the spirit would be rejoined to Judah and to Jerusalem. And so it was a very deep prophetic act that Elijah had done. And we can see in a very real way how God is bringing forth the restoration of that altar. Actually, in the Hebrew, it says, and Elijah healed the altar of the Lord. Now, the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem, of course, is the place where God made peace between heaven and earth, the Jewish people and the nations and broke down the wall of partition between Jew and Gentile. So the altar of Jerusalem must be restored as we read in the book of Ezra chapter three on its original foundations for the church to be restored according to the apostolic pattern so that the fire and the rain can come, which speaks of uh, a glorious manifestation of the Lord in Jerusalem and Israel, which will affect uh, the church worldwide and the nations. And as this unity is manifested more and more, the church will make known to the principalities and the power, the manifold wisdom of God, not only through the proclamation of the word, but through the incarnation of the word in that unity that confirms the altar of Jesus, the cross at Jerusalem. And so, the issue is the house of God. And when we speak of the house of God, ultimately, we think of the early church in Jerusalem, which was really a kingdom expression of the church. It was much, much more than church as we know it today. It was really uh, an expression of the calling of Israel to be a royal priesthood. And the Lord spoke with his disciples before he ascended into heaven. He spoke again of the kingdom of God and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost was truly a manifestation of the kingdom of God in the way the church lived out its life in Jerusalem as a community, as the manifestation of the shared life that exists within the triune God between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What was in heaven was manifested on earth 
in that apostolic community made up essentially of Jewish believers. So in the end time, the Lord is focusing on the bride and we see more and more the apostasy that is taking place in the different denominations. And the Lord is looking to form a people of God with a kingdom mentality rather than just a denominational mentality. And this is very much the issue of the last days and the restoration of the house of God and specifically in Jerusalem. Because today in Jerusalem, though we can see a messianic community that is growing uh, and all over the country, of course, it still expresses very much a kind of denominational pattern. Not that the church in Jerusalem is denominational as it is in Africa where you have so many different denominations. We don't really have denominations, but we do have congregations that are either related somehow to, to denominations or just congregations that are individual congregations. And though there is uh, a form of uh, unity between us and we meet together, at least part of the leadership uh, on a monthly basis, still it is far from being what God is calling the Jerusalem church to be. And in Haggai 2, Haggai speaks of the time when God again will shake all things. And in that time, the Lord says that the glory of the latter house will be greater than the former house. So there is a glory that God is promising to manifest in his house. And of course, that has to do again with the unity that Jesus speaks of in John 17. But it's not just a unity, it's really a bridal union that exists between him and his people. And as we come into that union with the Son, as he lives that same union with his Father, he will give, he has given us his glory that we may be made perfect in one. And in some way, it will be that in Jerusalem, God will restore the Jerusalem house to be the key to bring together that one body of Messiah. How he does that, we do not know. We see in part, we see persecution coming to the church over the nations, especially now uh, in, the, in, in, in the Western countries, according to the new laws that are being made. But we see and we know that that prayer that the Lord has prayed specifically for those who will be made one with him and with each other, that prayer will be answered. And that is really to contend for the covenant. And to contend for the covenant also means that the time will come when the one people of God will be able to come together at the one table of the Lord. The table of the Lord is the testimony of the covenant. The testimony, it is the table that the Lord has set before our enemies, as we read in, in Psalm 23. It is the testimony that speaks of what the Lord has fulfilled, the Lord's presence in his body today, and the ultimate fulfillment in his kingdom at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so in Jerusalem, there must be that incarnate expression where the elder brother can serve at the communion table to all the different parts of the body as the ultimate testimony that in Jerusalem, 
the altar of God is being restored on its ancient co uh, covenantal foundations. And so we need to pray, we need to pray that the body in Jerusalem becomes much more an expression of that kingdom life that the early church knew. And for a fresh, a time of refreshing. The church in Jerusalem and in Israel is in need of a fresh outpouring of the spirit. I am not speaking here directly yet of the outpouring on the whole nation. I'm speaking specifically upon the body of Messiah, that the body of Messiah in Israel can begin to enter into real travail, to a travail that will bring forth that man-child that we read about in Revelation 12, that man-child which will be a true expression in in a covenanted people in Israel, but over the nations as well of who Yeshua is. And we know as we read Revelation 12 that the enemy, the enemy is particularly interested uh, to destroy this man child uh, at the moment of his birth. But it is this man child that must come forth, this overcoming body who is the bride to the Lord, but who are the sons of God to the Father, to be that prophetic voice, to be that incarnational reality amongst the people of Israel, to reveal the face of Yeshua HaMashiach to Israel, to have the power to overcome the forces of darkness and religiosity in this city and to bring deliverance, to bring in the Jubilee year, but also to be that prophetic voice to the church and to the nation so that the word of the Lord will come forth again from Jerusalem. Now, to come to the end uh, of this sharing, I just want to remember Revelation 11, verses 1 and 2. I was given a measuring rod, a reed, and the angel said, rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple, do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles and they will trample the holy city. And so what God is really looking to and what God is really measuring and what we need to look to as watchmen is the altar of God and those who worship they're in. That is the heart. That is the epicenter. That is the heart in Israel from where we will see the, the final manifestation of the bride, of the man-child, but of course this connects to the universal body of Messiah. Because if Jerusalem is really the hub, that means, as we read in Romans 11, that the branches, all of the branches are grafted in to this cultivated olive tree that is rooted in heaven, but also in the city of Jerusalem. So amidst all of the great battles and the deceptions of the end time, this prophetic bridal remnant are those and i'll just read two more scriptures and i'm going to terminate because i want to i want to honor the time frame that i've been given let's just look at psalm 50 psalm 50 verse 2 out of zion 
the perfection of beauty, the perfection of beauty, God will shine forth. Our God shall come and shall not keep silent. And verse five is the key. Gather my saints together to me. Those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. In the Hebrew, it sounds more like those who have entered into my covenant with me by sacrifice. So these are those watchmen who are led by the spirit amongst whom Jesus is really enthroned, who are preparing the way and watching over the destiny of Jerusalem and the Davidic throne of Yeshua by contending for the covenantal foundations and by following the lamb wherever he goes. Those who are led by the spirit of God are the sons of God. So ultimately it is preparing for the return of the king and for the marriage supper of the lamb. So Lord, we thank you. We thank you that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, which means that as your testimony comes to life more and more in us, the prophecy that we are watching for, that we are waiting for is being fulfilled. The prophecy of the bride, the prophecy of the marriage supper, the prophecy of the restoration of Jerusalem as it relates to Israel, the nation, as it relates to the whole church, as it relates to all the nations, from whence again, Lord, in your time and in your way, you will be manifested and you will speak. And we do thank you, Lord, for the connection between the earthly and the heavenly Jerusalem, O oh God. And we thank you, O oh God, that we are living in the time that we can contend for this city, that she will be finally set free with her children from her bondage from the bondage, all the different bondages that we see in this city and in this land. And we thank you for the body of Messiah, for those who are with us this day, who are contending for the future of this city, the prophetic future of this city, for your kingdom to come, O oh Lord, and for you to be Seated on the throne of David, as the angel Gabriel said to Mary, he will sit on the throne of David, his father, and rule over the house of Jacob forever. So we give you thanks and praise, and I want to bless all of these brothers and sisters. And yes, Lord, we thank you that you are joining us into one in the vision of God that you have for your people in these end times, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you so much, Reuben. Um, Sue, we didn't exactly talk about this, but I think that we it would be really appropriate to, I would like to have Jenny Hager um, just pray a, a prayer, uh, especially for the body of, uh, of believers uh, in, Jerusalem and in Israel um, to come together as Reuben was uh, was talking about. And then it would be Karen uh, Davis has uh, volunteered to um, lead us in a, in a worship song. And I think that will be just perfect because but, it will help us to, to settle in on what the, on what this teaching really was, because it was more than just a more than just information. There was an impartation there and we want to really receive the fullness of that.
Brent, uh, I, I agree. I just wanted to uh, accentuate something in that, um, has Reuven, you just cemented the whole week together. I hope we all saw that. And um, that it is about covenant. And um, I just wanted to make people aware that we do have a signal thread. It's called the ninth hour. And the Lord spoke to me about a year and a half ago about the ninth hour being critical is the hour Jesus, you know, of the, the evening sacrifice. It was when Jesus paid it all. I have a feeling that 3 p.m. is going to be a significant time. But anyway, if you want to align with covenantal issues, the whole purpose of the ninth hour uh, thread is to build up the spiritual walls of Jerusalem from the nations to Jerusalem, connect the, those us with the Israeli priests that are being raised up now, and uh, to bring forth those watchmen that are connected when we can blow the trumpet and we can actually hear and respond. It's, it's happening for Egypt on Saturday. So um, instead of taking any time now with things that are going on, it's in the chat and I will send out an email tomorrow. So check your emails. Um, and Pastor Ruben, I, I cannot express to you as our thanks for what you have just spoken. Mm -hmm. It has sealed the deal in not only on earth, but I believe in heaven. And thank you for your ears that hear and your heart that speaks the truth. Yep. Yep. And, Jenny. And, and yes, and welcome, Pastor Ruben, to the, to the Global Watch. You are uh, becoming part of our family here, and we're, we're just mm -hmm. delighted to, uh, to have you share with us. Um, Jenny, could you just pray for um, just pray for the believers in Israel? And we'll just we'll just agree with you. What a message, Father! Um, we're so inspired, Lord, by the message we've just heard. Lord, you're taking us deeper and deeper into that river. Lord, we our hearts cry out to you, Father, breathe on the living stones in Israel, Father, breathe on the, on the living stones in Jerusalem, Lord God, by your grace, Father, pour out your grace, Father, and unite them together, Father, in, in Yeshua's name, unite them together, Father, in covenant as, as the bride, and strengthen them, Father, in the in the struggles that they're facing strengthen them father in the persecution that comes strengthen them father so many of them need finance lord we know to continue to properly do the work you're calling them to do open our eyes lord to their needs and open our ears and remind us to continually father to continually pray and intercede for them to continually stand on the walls as watchmen on the walls lord watching over we are your watchmen father we are your watchmen we are watching uh, as you are guiding us and you're leading us and then father let us take what we see and take it in prayer and intercede to father as as weeping men as weeping women anointed by you Father, to see your purposes fully restored on our watch in our day. In Jesus' mighty name, Yeshua HaMashiach, we thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Jenny. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Aaron, go ahead. Yeah. Hallelujah. I, Reuben, I just want to thank you as well. I, I'm so moved. Um, one of the things that Reuben talked about was uh, the the altar being restored on Carmel as as representing the spirit of Elijah that we're to be carrying to prepare the way of the Lord, and that He truly is joining um, the living stones together around the nation for the northern with Jerusalem. And so it's it's just I know it's not an accident that uh, we're here representing Carmel and Jerusalem today. Hallelujah, Lord. We thank you for the unity of the body. We thank you for the bride of Messiah. We thank you, Lord, that you have broken down the wall. Hallelujah. And Lord, we just want to come um, 
as, as one body, as one bride before you, O oh God, worshiping the Lamb before your throne, O oh God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. second we have a little announcement or um during this worship and hearing this message the lord has really prompted my heart i have we don't do this very often but i feel like um the lord is calling us to give to these ministries in israel they've gone through a tough season and we wanted to open up this opportunity for you to give uh to um, Pastor Ruben's uh, ministry to Karen Davis's ministry. We, you can do it online. I will put a, a note in it on the email that I send out tomorrow. Um, but if it is in your heart to give, um, just put a note on it. You can do it through the donation site that you want to give to a certain ministry. We take, uh, and I do thank you. There are people that are volunteering just to support, you know, $5 a month, $10, everything helps. Um, but we, we don't take any money for ourselves. We've never taken any money for ourselves. It all goes to the ministry. And um, uh, I feel that there is a, 
the Lord is asking us to do this tonight. And so as we close off tonight, please um, ponder before the Lord what you might want to sow in. You can go to theglobalwatch.com and there's a donation site right on, online. And I'll, I'll have it in the email tomorrow as well. So, Fred, do you want to? Amen. Amen. You don't, do you have any more uh, announcements or anything before we close? All right. Well, I, there, we, there's been so much to ponder in this message. And, uh, but um, again, we just want to thank you, Pastor Reuben and um, Karen. I, I just uh, want to just honor you for uh, pulling us together from the nations to hear from Israel and God is really knitting our hearts, not only to each other, but he's knitting our hearts to Israel in the way that only he can do. And we're, we're just, um, we're wanting more. We're, we're hungry to, uh, to honor the Lord in that, in that way. And, uh, and so it's, we're really blessed. Thank you for your wisdom in, uh, in doing this and pulling this all together. And, um, and we just bless you in your ministry, Karen. We just say that the best days of your life and your ministry are ahead of you and not behind you. Amen. All God's people said, amen. amen. Everybody unmute yourselves. Oh, Wave to each other. Amen. Say, I bless you in the amen. name of the Lord. I bless you in the name of the Lord. I bless you in the name of the Lord. I bless you in the name of the Lord. I bless you in the name of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Bless you, Karen David, Stephen. Bless you, Congratulations. Thank you. God bless you. Wonderful, wonderful.